Always We ask the question. What is the world? Weber, it's a pleasure to have you on Al Jazeera. Thank you pleasure for joining here, us. I want to go back to your previous life as the head of the German Central Bank. I think that should be our starting point today because we've got a financial crisis in this world which is ongoing and which started back at that time. You were the head of the German Central Bank from 2004 to 2011. That is in the, the peak time of that financial crisis. Were you aware at the time of just how exposed the banking sector was? You know, we focus a lot on the United States and the subprime mortgages and all that, but German banks were very, very exposed to those mortgage-backed securities. Were you aware at the time of how severe it was? Actually, the first fallout from the U.S. crisis happened in Germany. You're absolutely right. The market froze up uh, in Japan around early August, and the first bank that we had to rescue was IKB, a German Mittelstandsbank that basically was a small lender in Germany. And when we looked at their book and we looked at the exposures that they had in the U.S. subprime market, uh, our view was very, very clear. If this crisis is going to continue and deepen, which was the case, then this crisis is going to come home to roost in the U.S. market. So isn't this something that, and I realize there was a separate regulator at the time, Buffin was a separate regulator to the central bank, but isn't this something you should have known and that Buffin should have known and that the regulation should have been strong enough to pick up on these things before it became a crisis? It's one thing definitely that the U.S. authorities first and foremost should have watched very, very closely in their home backyard. Uh, when we're talking about a global financial crisis, this crisis started at the heart of the global financial system in the most advanced economy in the global economy, that is the U.S. market. And it started in the biggest part of that market, that is the mortgage markets for U.S. subprime mortgages. These mortgages were politically very, very strongly felt that they should happen and to bring people into home ownership. But the whole process of generating, of distributing, origination plus distribution was very, very weak. And in global regulation, everyone relied on everyone else to watch their own backyard when glo global regulators collaborated. And of course, you know, we very early on with the U.S. authorities were focusing on managing this crisis. Mm -hmm. But it clearly was a fallout of a U.S. Uh, market onto the rest so, of the so world. So central banks, not just in the US, but everywhere, weren't watching their own backyards enough? Because it's the thing, you must, you must all talk to each other in, this, right. in, in your position as central bankers. You must all collaborate and, and, and share information, but did everyone miss it? I just can't, I, I struggle to, I still struggle to, to believe that everyone missed this one. No, it's, it's not that everyone missed it. There were early warning signs. People were focused on it, but the whole dynamics of how suddenly ratings, for example, started coming down, market prices started coming down was really something that was unprecedented. But remember, when this started in 2007, it was still managed. It had some fallout, but it was still managed well. We didn't have the whole financial system uh, come down. What we had is we managed the, the crisis pretty well for over a year. Uh, we rescued quite a few German banks by supporting them with finance, but the crisis really became a global crisis and a deep crisis with the default of Lehman Brothers. So you could re actually say that there was some mortgage problems and write downs, but when the crisis really became a global crisis was when Lehman defaulted and we had to rescue the fallout from that. But the, the, the seeds of Lehman Brothers came from all of this, all the mortgage-backed securities and the subprime. Again, the, the point I'm trying to get to is that this was building for a long time and then it just it got huge all of a sudden and out of control to the point that a bank like Lehman's collapsed and then everything collapsed. The, the warning signs, were they not picked up on? Why were they not picked up on along the way? Warning signs were picked up and actually we were in contact with all of the banks that we had in Germany very early on. We watched their liquidity, we watched their capital position. But remember, the whole re-regulation that set in was for one simple reason. Mark Carney recently said banks now have to hold seven times as much capital against risk than they had before the standards. And that is something that shows that maybe the standards for capitalization were a bit too weak. They were okay in good times for fair weather sailing, but when the winds got rougher and when you know financial markets became more turbulent, uh, there was clearly a shortage of capital in international banks. And part of the re-regulation was a necessary response to these old capital standards not being really uh, providing the safeguards that they should have provided against some financial risk. So I would say uh, this is an unprecedented crisis. It was the deepest crisis in post-war history. 
and against that deepest crisis, which was in many views seen with science here and science there, but nobody had the size of this financial crisis and the sort of uh, dynamics of this crisis, uh, they were really not something that anybody at this point in time had really anticipated. We dealt with it as we moved along, mm -hmm. and we learned the lessons basically with the new capital standards. So I think regulators were on top of managing this crisis. Okay, you've led me nicely to uh, somewhere I was going to go later in this interview, but I think the fact that you've talked about banks needing to have the right amount of capital against the risk that they have. Let me give you an example right now. Deutsche Bank, which is Germany's biggest bank, currently has more than 55 trillion euros exposure to derivatives. Um, we could get into the ins and outs of derivatives, but I guess for our viewers to basically explain an investment, which is a, a, a contract between two parties, it, it derives its value from, from that underlying thing, you know, a stock or an asset or, or a rate. It is inherently more risky. It relies on a partnership. And yet something like Deutsche Bank has 55 trillion euros exposure to that. That is the size essentially of the global economy. That to me says there's still low, so much risk out there. Banks are still pushing it. and it could all, maybe it couldn't all fall apart again, but the risk is still there, the huge risk is still there. There are still risks in financial markets. Financial markets are there. Well, they're inherently risky, aren't they? I mean, they're inherently risky. Yeah. Financial yeah. markets are there to manage risk, but uh, they're there to have good risk control systems and to be able to manage those risks well. I can't speak to any other bank but UBS. I can mm -hmm. talk about UBS, uh, but what we have done is we have reduced our funded balance sheet roughly by a factor of two-thirds. We have uh, deleveraged uh, our balance sheet massively, we de-risked our balance sheet, mm -hmm. and I think that's the way to go. In the new world where capital is a more scarce resource, increasing capital ratios and de-risking the balance sheet is one way that banks need to react to this crisis. Don't we still have a situation of quote unquote too big to fail? This was what we were supposed to move away from, these banks that were too big to fail and that everything would be more manageable and they wouldn't need bailouts and the like. Are we not still in a situation where that exists? We are on the way. I mean, nobody has pretended that we yet solved the too big to fail regime. Remember, most of the regulation that we're focusing on is being phased in over many years. Some of the Basel regulation until 2019. We at UBS have front loaded that adjustment and we now fulfill all the capital and liquidity requirements that we would need to fulfill by 2019. But it's not the end of the journey. Bail-inable capital, the so-called concept of TLAC, banks are working to become more resilient. We're just changing the, gr the group holding structure, for example, to have a holding company so that there is a holding above the operating units, which will help resolvability. So work on too big to fail, in my view, is going to continue for many years before we're actually at that point in time where banks can fail more safely. We're not yet there. We're on the journey, and I think some of the banks, like UBS, are on that journey faster than others. What about central banks and regulators? If we go to that, are they, in your opinion, doing the right thing? Again, I'm looking for your opinion as a former central banker yourself. A, a lot of uh, politicians have put a lot more power into the, into the central banks, and I still wonder if that's the right idea, given that central banks and regulation was uh, part of the problem in the first place. I wouldn't necessarily say part of the problem, but uh, I'm also somebody that's skeptical that giving central banks ever more powers is the right way to do, uh, to go. Uh, what we're seeing is there is a lot of trust in central banks to be able to manage crisis. In many countries, you mentioned Germany, where the central bank was not the supervisor of banks mm -hmm. before, the central banks have been entrusted with banking supervision. UK is one of these examples. Uh, what is I'm that right, in your opinion? To, well, to I think it is a, a reaction to the crisis, mm -hmm. but uh, my concern is much more that central banks actually have a core mandate, which is price stability mm -hmm. and ensuring price stability through good central banking. If you entrust central banks with more and more objectives and with more and more things to do, uh, targets to fulfill, they start seeing trade-offs. And these trade-offs can basically dilute or lead them astray mm -hmm to focus away from that primary objective. So I think that narrow central banking that is focusing on a core mandate and focusing on that is the better way to go. And when we were had a discussion in Germany about uh, the central bank becoming the main supervisor, mm -hmm. I said I will not accept that task if it comes at the expense of re have a reporting line to the government and being less independent in what we do in our core mandate from governments. And usually banking supervision comes with such a dimension. You suddenly need to report into government. You have parliaments to respond to. 
and therefore I think central banks are not necessarily the best institution to be entrusted with banking supervision. They can play a role, they need to have the information, in particular on liquidity management. Central banks play a key role and did play a key role in the crisis, but on prudential, on microprudential supervision, that is a task that ultimately governments step in and therefore government agencies, in my view, are as well equipped for doing that job as central banks, maybe even slightly better. What do you think, just briefly, on what the European Central Bank is doing now, finally going down the road of quantitative easing? Is it the right thing to do? Is it too little too late? I wouldn't say it's too little too late. If it's not the right thing to do, it can't be too little too late. Um, in my view, I'm skeptical that quantitative easing will fix a lot of the problems that Europe has. I don't see a sustained deflation problem in Europe, uh, I see the, uh, a weak economy, and as a, as a result of a weak economy, I see very little price pressures. By the way, that's not just a European phenomenon. If you look at how oil prices have come down, if you look at how many central banks are easing monetary policy around the globe, the global economy is still in a weak spot. And at that point in time, I do expect some muted price pressures. And if on top of that commodity shocks come, then I do expect some weak inflation readings for at least 12, uh, 16 months. So I'm not surprised we see these weak inflation numbers. I'm not sure that buying a huge amount of government debt it provides the right incentives. Europe doesn't have a liquidity problem. Europe has a problem that growth is not there, and growth is not there because we haven't seen the right set of reforms for European governments to embark on. Many of these economies need more flexible economies, more flexible labor markets. If you have 25% unemployment rate, it just shows you that people do not enter the labor market at, to the degree they could. And in very many countries, youth unemployment, which in some places is 50%, just shows that rigidities in the labor market prevent in particular the young from entering the workforce. There's a lot of things that need to be done with structural reforms of the labor markets, of social security systems, of the cost of running a government. There's not necessarily just the only problem of funding governments, which is what central banks are addressing with QE. So I think Europe is doing something where it's buying time through central bank action, but if that time is not used wisely for doing the right set of reforms, I think Europe in a couple of years will look as bad as it does today. And so I think governments really need to step up and really need to do the right things that will enhance growth in the long run. That's the European problem. Europe has a growth problem. It has an aging problem. It has a demographic problem. It doesn't have a liquidity problem. It's got a debt problem, though, doesn't it? And this is something I want to discuss with you, the sort of um, the morals of debt. I mean, we can use Greece's, Greece as an example. Um, where Syriza has come in and said, right, we don't want austerity, or at least it said that before the election, and then it had to renege on that and then had to get a bailout uh, extension. So clearly, it, you know, the situation has not improved there in Greece. Now, there are any number of options here. Um, the bailout extension is the one that's been taken, or you could let Greece flounder, let it, let it default on its debts. I mean, isn't there something to be said for that sort of thing? in this world where we seem to rely on bailouts and IMF and World Bank and all that, let it default, let the people take a hit, let the creditors take a hit, and then start again. I know I'm being very simplistic there, but isn't there something to be said for that? Well, I wouldn't just start with the most extreme position, that is a debt default. A debt default is usually uh, the last resort that a government would resort to because it, will, uh, it wasn't able to address the debt issue with, with milder measures. But if you just look at the world where we're now, uh, we have a number of countries being the biggest debtors uh, in the world. Uh, first and foremost, the United States. Uh, there's other countries, the UK, France, Italy, that run big deficits. There are surplus countries. Uh, there are countries that are net creditors to the world because at the world level, uh, we can't be indebted. So somebody's debt is another uh, person's credit and some country's debt is another country's credit. Mm -hmm. And the biggest creditor countries in the world are first and foremost Japan, China, Germany, Switzerland. So these countries have been running relatively prudent fiscal policy. Their corporates have invested in the rest of the world. They usually have current account surplus. They export to the rest of the world. And they basically live off some proceeds that they get from being repaid for that debt. And if you're running a central bank policy at the moment where central banks drive interest rates to zero, that's a policy that has redistributive effect. It's a policy that favors debtors, and it actually doesn't favor creditors. Creditors who face zero interest rate environment can't get a return on their credits, 
And so there is a big redistribution happening. And that's why some countries, you know, I mentioned Germany and Switzerland, are quite skeptical of these mes measures because of their redistributive uh, effects. Uh, this will basically invalidate some, to some degree pension claims. This will lead to lower insurance premia and to lower insurance costs for those that use insurances for old age savings. And so in general, these policies have very strong redistributive effects. Central banks are usually entrusted with policies that should be more neutral. So mm -hmm. central banks should look at price stability. Price stability favors in particular those in the economy that spend a large part of their income on current expenditure. That's why protecting uh, price stability is something that has a favorable effect for those in the economy that are weak, that can't insure against inflation. Financial institutions can insure in in against inflation because they can buy inflation insurance. So a central bank that runs a policy that favors debtors clearly is leaving a neutral mandate and is uh, doing some policies that has redistributive effect. And that's been much more hotly debated uh, in our economies than policies that usually focus on the core of price stability mandates. And that's why central banks are picking choices. And in Germany or in Switzerland, the current policies of actually uh, running QE are, are looked at very, very critically mm. just for that reason. But what about, sorry, I'm going to bring it back to this whole idea of, of, of of sort of the morals of the whole situation. If you or I took out a loan or used our credit card, we have to pay it back, don't we? And that whole, that very basic theory seems to have disappeared now. Now it's, oh, okay, we're in debt, so can you bail us out? Yes, but then we have to pay off the bailout as well. And then this one opposes the idea of the bailout and the new government comes in and wants to do this. The very, very basics of borrowing and of debt and of credit seem to have gone out the window. Well, I, I don't think it has. And uh, in my view, I just explained to you the, the philosophy on economic policy in Germany that is the predominant theory uh, in how German economists look at this. It's not gone out of the window. Our finance minister has just reached a balanced budget. He is not living uh, on the expense of future generations. He is taking the stability and growth pact and the Maastricht criteria uh, seriously. Uh, he has reduced the net new uh, debt to a level where basically debt is starting to stabilize. And as Germany comes back to growth, and as our debt to GDP ratio doesn't uh, deteriorate any further uh, with, a, with a balanced budget, then we actually start seeing an improvement on the overall debt situation. So debt will come down as a relation But of you're GDP. giving me an example there of a, of a fairly strong economy, a comparatively strong economy like Germany. These other countries, the, the so-called Eurozone periphery, it's not like that. They don't have that sort of underlying strength and they find themselves in this sort of trouble. It's not about underlying strengths. It's about living with in your budget constraint. That's what the debt to GDP ratio mm. tells you. And have if they you not? Have, have they if not? you have a, a weaker economy, you can you cannot spend as much money mm. for running a government that you, as if you had a stronger economy. So the whole philosophy of the stability and growth pact was not to influence countries' expenditure or revenue separately, but to simply influence what is below the line. Below the line. What it says, if you run a balanced budget or a slight surplus, which is the European rule, mm. it means if you cannot create revenues through fiscal uh, revenues, then you cannot run expenditure at the level that you could otherwise do. And the only thing you can do there is reducing expenditure. It has the name austerity, and austerity has got a bad uh, reputation. Uh, reputation, but it's the only way to stay within the budget constraint. And that's what prudent governments do. That's what the German government has done. And you cannot write a plank check for the, gov the rest of the governments of the Eurozone. They need to basically live by the same rules of financial discipline. And you cannot simply lose track of that. Live within uh, their means, in other words. Live within like their all, means. Like all of us. <laughs> not, spend more, not spend more than they raise in terms of revenue. And some countries, if you look at Germany, Germany has a a government uh, expenditure to GDP ratio that in terms of the size of government, France has a 10 percentage points higher share in GDP with the government than Germany has. So very, very clearly the following, ex the, the expenditure that result from that are higher in a country uh, like France where you have a higher government to GDP ratio than in Germany. And you can never issue a joint liability if one country s usually spends 10 percent more on the economy from government resources than another economy like Germany. So 
really, we're at the point in time we're in a debt crisis, and in a debt crisis, the only thing that helps you get out of debt is to consolidate rather than to toy with the idea of a default on that debt. I think that would be completely the wrong way to deal with it. Okay, okay then. Let's leave debt and Europe and crises behind there, and let's talk about your current job as the, as the chairman of UBS. You've been there since May of 2012. Without putting too fine a point on it, UBS has had a lot of trouble. And I can list off a number of things. These are not necessarily all under your watch, but the bank losing over $2 billion in rogue trading, fined $1.5 billion as part of the LIBOR rate scandal, $780 million on charges that helped evade wealthy taxes. When this job came to you, why did you want to take it? Why did you, why did you want to, with your reputation of central banking and as an economist and an academic as well, why did you want to come in and be the quote-unquote fix-it guy? for UBS. Well, let me just correct. So most of this stuff you mentioned happened long before our time. What we're doing is we're basically turning the bank around. And, and that's the point I'm making, that you are coming in and you're, you're the guy who's got to fix the reputation, basically. I mean, that's a huge risk for you personally to have to come in and do. We've got to fix the bank. Uh, we've got to fix the strategy. We have done that to a large extent. We have raised uh, our capital. We're one, now one of the in our peer group, we have the best capital ratio, we have very prudent liquidity management, and we're dealing with the legacy issues. And uh, part of that uh, job involves dealing with previous mistakes the bank made. But we're very focused on running the business in a different model now. Mm -hmm. We're very focused on, say, in the investment bank, focusing on our corporate client and the core of our wealth management franchise. And for me, the, uh, the real issue about banking is if banks move to a new standard, uh, if regulation asks banks to run capital and liquidity better, it is an interesting job to actually facilitate that turnaround mm. and reorient the bank towards where regulators uh, want to have these banks. When you came into UBS, what was your reaction? Did you look at it and think, oh my goodness, what have I done? What, what am I going to do with this place? Because you're looking at a situation where, and again, not under your watch, but you're fixing past mistakes of staff and management who took risks who in some cases broke the law i mean how do you even wh what do you even think when you when you're faced with that as in a new job what well, we were very clear saying and that was my discussion with ubs uh, this bank has to change do we have the mandate current management and board to turn that bank around and bring it into the new reality of the new regulation for me as a former regulator, it is one thing to draw up new rules for better capital, for more liquidity. And I was a member on uh, the uh, group of uh, on the FSB steering committee on many of the regulatory bodies. So one thing is designing the new rules. The other one, and I found that interesting, is to actually help run a bank and reorient it and actually prepare it for that new reality and show that it can be done. And we were among the banks that changed their strategy early because we believed investment banking would be a totally different uh, endeavor under the new rules compared to the old rules. Mm -hmm. So we refocused and reshaped the investment bank first and foremost as part of our strategic turnaround. When we did this, everyone, including the international media, said what UBS is trying to achieve cannot be done. You cannot run an investment bank that is balance sheet light, that is focused on core activities. You have to provide all services to everyone, everywhere, to be a good investment bank. Look where we are now. What UBS has done is becoming discussed in international markets as the role model for investment banks. We, reach, we re received the prize last year from Euromoney as best global bank, and part of that was our new strategy. So what we're trying to do is basically create the bank of the 21st century that is a global bank, that is a universal bank, that is, but is focused on its core competencies. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And I think that turnaround and being part of that turnaround and reorientation and showing that the new regulation can actually be done mm -hmm. and it will help you to run banks in a better way, that was for me what tempted me in order to try my hand on, on a banking job. Part of turning a bank around is about perception and about reputation. And unfortunately, I wonder if those things, uh, tax evasion and, 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 and LIBOR and, and, and rogue trading, if they stick, and that you're, it's difficult for you to actually change the perception of banking in, in, in the public's eyes. 
Absolutely, and with every new scandal uh, that uh, comes up because we solve an issue from the past, the news that come out are today's news. Mm. So there is the perception that these things happen now. S many of them actually happened years ago, but in cleaning this up, we bring the news up and we have a debate in public. It's absolutely right. Banks need to change. And I think it's also true that what, what we want to do as changes needs to stick. It, it's not just enough to solve a legacy issue. You also have to make sure, and that is part of the process with law enforcement agencies, that you have to stick to these rules. Mm -hmm. And when you do these and when you roll out these programs, of course it takes time to turn around the bank. Of course you don't achieve success instantly, but you've got to keep at it. You've got to persistently try and change these banks, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, yes, of course there will be setbacks. We've seen setbacks and it is important that every time you have a setback you just got to focus more, even more, on doing the right thing and in telling everyone these setbacks cannot happen. They, they will erode the base of confidence that banks are based on. Let me remind you of one thing. Creator is a word that means uh, trust. Mm -hmm. So banks live of trust. Credit is a trust issue. And if banks cannot reinvigorate and reinstall this trust in what they're doing, being service provider to the clients that they serve, then I think banking will be in for a very, very bad future. Your CEO, Sergio Amotti, uh, when you talk about current news, the more current news with him is that he had his pay increase last year, up by half a million dollars from 10.7 million to 11.2 million. I understand this. People get paid a lot in banking. There will always be public outrage about that. But how do you give a CEO of a bank a pay rise when all this, when, when you're still in the process of turning a bank around. Now I know that banks perform well in performance uh, based raises and things like that, but again this perception thing I want to go back to, people won't have trust in banks if they see the head guy getting paid more money like this. We had our performance was up quite substantially last year and our pay was not up uh, relative to our performance increase. What we did is we gave the CEO uh, somewhat more, uh, but most of what we pay nowadays is deferred. Uh, all of the compensation that our CEO gets outside his fixed compensation is deferred of up to five years. It's completely at risk and if anything happens and if performance is not sustained, it will not be paid out. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we have a compensation system where the number you just announced mm -hmm. is a flow of income that he's entitled to over the next five years, both granted to him in terms of shares of the company, but also in terms of write-down bonds, that if our capital ratio, for example, falls below 10%, those write-down bonds are written down to zero. Does the buck stop with him or with you? The buck stops with everyone that has responsibility in the bank. But you oversee it. You're the chairman of the board, right? And you, I have you sign off on things and you... I have a responsibility just like the CEO and just like every member of the board and every member of our management team. We are solidly focused on, ex on executing a turnaround in this bank. We have just said the strategic turnaround is largely done. Uh, we are very focused on turning this bank around and we all face our responsibility in that process. Axel Weber, it's a pleasure been talking to you. Thank you for joining us on Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. Thank you. Always.